Who knows we get started tonight? Um, looks like we're going to be kind of a smaller group, which is okay. Um, to kind of start us off a little bit, the first thing that I did want to mention is, is that um, next week we'll take like a we'll take a break next week, um, mainly at the direction of John Harmon, uh, because there's just some differences, and and obviously you know in the United States we have daylight savings time, and then you know I learned just this week that Europe also does that as well, but it's at a different date so that happens this week and the united states happens next week and so that just kind of screws everything up i know most of us here are here in the states but just for um john's sanity he was like everybody just take a week off and then we will get it all back in balance so and i think it'd be good for us to kind of take a break a little bit so we can kind of um just take a little bit of a rest and then come back that following week i am planning on coming back that next week off, or not next week but the following week so that we can, you know, keep working on this. But um, just a heads up, we won't have a session next week. So let's kind of talk about tidy evaluation. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here. Make sure I'm not sharing anything. Okay, cool. Mm, share screen. So I'll be a hundred percent honest in that I haven't really dived. Uh, too much outside of the chapter. I knew I was kind of talking about, can you guys see my screen? Okay, cool. Um, Cause I wanted to spend some more time looking at tidy evaluation and one outside of just like shiny, but then I started to kind of realize that tidy evaluation gets kind of like spread out in many different topics. And I just didn't have time to kind of dig a little bit beyond shiny. Um, I think I got a pretty good job of how tidy evaluation is used in the shiny app context, but outside of that, uh, my understanding is a little bit loose. So to kind of get us started, we're going to kind of talk about what tidy evaluation is. And I really want to take a step back and kind of get like a big picture view of it. And so I was just kind of like digging around and trying to figure out like, where's this definition of tidy evaluation? Like, can someone just give me like, one sentence definition of what tidy evaluation is. And the one that I kind of came across was it was in the advanced R chapter 20 um, written by Hadley. But tidy eval provides a principled approach to non-standard evaluation that makes it possible to use such functions both interactively and embedded within other functions. And so it took me a little bit of while to kind of pick this apart and kind of understand this, but it really tidy evaluation, what it does, it helps make our data exploration more fluid and more interactive. So tidy evalu evaluation really shines when we're using like pipes with dplyr. So using dplyr pipes. So when we're trying to do like a taking a data object, grouping by, and then summarizing, what's nice about that is we don't have to necessarily reference like the data object when we're creating that pipe. And so it makes things more fluid. So instead of rather thinking about what are the variables in my environment, you can focus on what are my variables in the data set. And so Hadley kind of talks about this cost associated with this use. It makes it harder for us to reference variables indirectly. So if we want to like use a variable in our environment within such things as dplyr, verbs or within ggplot, especially within the aesthetic, it's kind of hard to indirectly reference those. And so we have to do certain conventions to allow us to reference those specific variables. Now, using tidyverse functions, uh, using this in tidyverse functions, uh, it, it requires a little bit more work, and we'll talk more about that here in a little bit. And it's also used when we want to give non-users an interface to work with tidyverse functions in a Shiny app. And I thought that was kind of an interesting point because say we want to give the application functionality where the user can like filter data. What we're actually doing is we're, allow we're giving the user an interface, the Shiny application, to basically use tidyverse code. That's basically what we're doing. But in doing that, because we we're using it in a different environment to which, and I'm going to say it, that tidyverse verbs and everything was intended to be used outside of like interactive analysis, and we're moving it in towards more of kind of like a programming kind of realm, we have to use different conventions to reference the different variables that we want. So tonight's discussion, what we're really going to focus on is applying these concepts in a shiny context. 
Uh, there is so much more to learn about this. Uh, in fact, I had everything that I kept reading suggested reading. If you want to learn more about this, applying it specifically within functions or functions within packages, or if you're using this in your own kind of like interactive analysis, you should be reading that meta programming section in advanced R. Uh, so just kind of a disclaimer to anybody who's watching this video later, if you're interested in uh, tidy evaluation in that application, this is not that conversation. This, this is the conversation of how to use tidy evaluation specifically in a shiny context. And so I may be missing certain terminology and certain applications, um, you know, in different areas in programming using um, tidyverse. So what we're going to do is we're going to apply ggplot function in an app, and then we're also going to apply a dplyr function in the app as well. So the other thing that the book really wanted to kind of emphasize is, you know, why should we know tidy evaluation? Why should we care about this? And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at this first example right here, 12-1. Um, and with this application, the functionality that we're trying to provide to the user is we're trying to give the user the ability to select a variable. And if it's numeric, we want the user, we want to give the user the ability to uh, filter the rows based on some threshold. And so what you're going to notice is when we kick off this app, the application is going to run, but it's not what we expect would happen. And so we have to kind of, and kind of give you the answer here, but kind of really look at this and, and figure out like, why is this the case? Why, why does our application not work when we have it run? So I'm going to run this real quick so that we can see it in action here. Application. I'm going to show with app and I'm in 12.1. So right here, so here's our application, or here's our application right here. Here's our specific code. Uh, pretty much, we've seen all this stuff before, so I'm not going to dig too deeply into it. Here's our UI. We give our user the ability to have select what type of variable that they want to use um, with their numeric input. They can set the limit, and this limit min right here is being applied within this filter statement. So you can see that we're using the diamonds data set and that we're filtering it based on one, the variable to which the user provides to us. And then we're also using that minimum threshold that's provided by the input as well. And if you actually look, once the app kicked off, the app is running, but it's not correct because we're supposed to be filtering out this character variable for any caret that's greater than one. And you can see that is actually not the case here. And so this is an issue with tidy evaluation, because if we go back to our go back to our notes, what tidy or what is actually um, being passed into that filter statement is this. We're passing in the diamonds data set. Yes, we have the one value as the minimum input, but it's actually sending in this string value of caret and caret technically as a string value doesn't exist. And so we have to do certain conventions to reference this differently. So let's see. So the, what's the problem with this? This is the problem of indirection. So when we're using tidyverse functions, like in an interactive kind of analysis, we don't have to explicitly express which variables we want to use. So I've kind of put some examples here. In the filter statement, we don't need to be explicit when we want empty cars, MPG we just write the variable name. So in our case right here, what I have here is I have two environment variables here. I have an environment variable minimum, and I have this variable, which is a string, mpg. If I do this and run this in a filter statement, mpg min, it runs in this filters correctly. Ooh. But if I try and take this var variable here, the string value, and I pass in var, this will not run correctly. Because again, it's thinking that it's this actual string value and it's not the variable within it. And that's just some of the functionality with tidyverse verbs is that using tidy evaluation, when we're doing some type of interactive analysis, it's like we're already passing this data object into it. And so we don't have to reference it. That's built into the functionality of um, some, of the uh, some of the like tidyverse um, verbs that we use here. 
So this is this becomes a little bit more clear if you look at this in base. And so in base, in some functions and not all, and I'll be I'll be honest with you too as well. I'm not as familiar with base functions as I am with like tidyverse. So the book kind of assumes that you have a good understanding of base when you kind of look at comparing these two. But I'm going to do the same operation here where I'm going to be filtering. But when I have to do this, I have to use some type of referencing to the types of variable that I want. And so I either have to use the dollar sign or I have to use um, double square bracket notation. And so if I try and do this with referencing MPG over min, this will not filter correctly. It will not give me what I need. If I want to filter it correctly, what I have to do is, is I have to first reference the data object empty cars and then the actual variable that I want to use and then filtering it by the min value. And so with this problem of indirection, it comes down to this question, you know, variable, variable. What do you mean by variable? And this is where it actually kind of clicked for me is when I kind of saw these two, this, this explained to me. When we say variable in this context, with, especially within Shiny, or when we're trying to apply tidy evaluation, is we're using the same word, but technically they have a different meaning. And so the book really talks about that if you know the difference in the variables that you're using, whether it's an environment variable or a data variable, it's gonna help you better understand this concept a little bit more. So with an environment variable, this is a programming variable that you create with that assignment operator. So if we go back up to our example here, we have two environment variables in this example. We have an environment variable of minimum, minimum, and a environment variable var as well. On the other side of this, we have the data variable, which is data frame variables. So if you're an analyst, you know, you're, you're pretty used to, you know, the columns within your data set. And so these are those statistical variables that live inside of a data frame. And so knowing these two differences is going to help you better understand how tidy evaluation is applied and when to best apply it. So how do we solve this problem? The solution depends on whether we're doing data masking or if we're doing tidy selection, which we'll talk about here in a second. This but, isn't a, sorry, go Carly. ahead. No, I, I, I was gonna gonna open up the question. No, I was gonna uh, open up the questions right now. <laughs> It, this is this is this is grander than just a class problem, right? It, it, it's not the error that you may get or the or the result you may get is not related to the class of variable. It's it's actually the environment that you're operating in, right? And I I, I do like your your uh, last comment. How do we solve this problem? Right? Decide exactly what you're doing with this particular data. Um, is it is it tidying or is it is it more uh, statistical or or you know programmatically uh, logically using that variable um, mathematically using that variable? I I hope I'm not repeating myself or I'm just trying to summarize what you're what you're implying here. This is bigger than just class. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I mean, like I'm still trying to wrap my mind around this as well, but it really kind of made sense, like you said, with like what environment are you trying to apply this to? You know, are you trying to apply an environment variable or are you trying to provide a variable within, you know, your data set, the columns that you're using? Am I, am I, am I on the right track? You're yes. Yes. A hundred percent. What I was, the, the thing that's itching in the back of my head about this topic in relation to R or into shiny um, is within your, operating systems path environment or your your environmental variables right if you're on unix and you just call out you know what's my what's my path to my you know r studio environment and you're going to get some kind of a, a namespace of of folder direct or directory uh, path that's being used within all of the the coding that makes up the r studio ide when it's running on your computer does that make sense it's two different, it, it, it's, it's one is more global where uh, the other is inside the, the, the program itself or inside the function itself. Um, Kevin, do you want to add anything to that? So I was, I was thinking while you were talking, oh, sorry, Kevin, go ahead. Just saying I have nothing. <laughs> like I was thinking about while you were talking there a little bit, Ryan, um, like I was kind of thinking about it 
um like if you think about it uh, maybe this might be a little bit off base but like sys.date right your sys.date is a variable that's global to your specific computer correct or it's it's uh i'm saying this kind of loosely this is the way i understand it is is that sys.date is actually pulling what my system thinks it is and that's a variable on my system it's not in our studio our studio doesn't have that but my system has that so if i took this and applied this this sys.date into another context like say i put it onto a server somewhere that server might have a different system date variable Right. Am I kind of following what you're, what you're a hundred percent? Yes. Okay. I always think of it like sys.date because like, you know, sometimes I apply my code in different areas and I'm like, well, that's like a global variable because that's a variable that's coming from the system. It's not coming from our, it's not coming from our studio. It's, it's according to the system, but like with that, like with tidy evaluation, we're drilling a little bit further. Like with we're driving, we're, dr we're drilling into like, the the function environment so like when we think about like filter this filter statement i'm going to pull this back up here and i think if we take a step back and look at it the filter this filter function has its own environment and inside of that you know you know the people who have designed tidyverse functions what they've done is is that they've made it so you don't have to be as explicit with what variables you're pulling on or what variables you're referencing to and so you can be, you don't have to be as explicit in the fact that you can say, in our case, we can just say MPG. We don't have to go MPG, empty cars, dollar sign MPG. But when we move this into the realm of like using it within a function within Shiny, we have to be very explicit if we're using an environment variable or for referencing a data variable. And is that is that clarifying? Am I on the right track? <laughs> no, definitely a hundred percent. And it, it it so the the thing you had mentioned uh, uh, option two or or line item number two uh, was where it clicked for you. Uh, for me, it's the it's the last statement, uh, the problem that you're trying to solve. And we run into this a lot in your coding of any other language beyond Shiny or be, beyond R. Um, where you have to call on something that isn't within the operating, it's not within the program that you're calling on. You're reliant on the system properties, the system date that you had, had used. You're reliant on other fact, uh, factors, fact, uh, I use the word variable over and over again, but um, it's, it's, it's more of a supportive role, administrative role to be able to host that, that program on that operating system. Um, I got a, another good reference and hopefully this might clear or uh, align everything. So if you're in Sigwin running on a Windows-based system, but you want to call on a particular package, we'll call it, um, I don't know, SSH, you want to you create a secure shell to connect to something else. Well, unless you have SSH loaded in your Sigwin environment, it doesn't know it exists. It is on Windows if you have it turned on, but you have to go outside of Sigwin to access the command prompt or the operating system of Windows to get the SSH. It's not a process ID either, and it's not a daemon. I apologize for using multiple uh, terms, but you've got to be able to get outside of the environment you're working in to access another component within the operating system itself. Um, and it, it makes sense. It, it totally, this, this totally uh, uh, solidifies exactly what's going on inside R. Yeah. Do no, I know I, that it exists or not? Yeah. Because when you were talking there, I was just thinking about that. And I think the, you know, the question, and I think your, I think your example definitely clarifies it even more because um, it really comes down to a conversation of environments and being able to pull values from different environments or so, if you if you can think ahead. of it as if you can think of it as a stack right so i'm at layer three of my stack and and or sorry i'm at layer six i'm at layer seven using using our studio i need to reach down and grab something at a stack number three i need to implicitly tell the operating sorry the environment that i'm working in this our studio environment at layer uh, seven i need to tell it 
exactly where uh, or how to get to layer three to get the, the, the uh, information it's looking for. Um, I don't know, onion, onion skins or, or onion peels. No, uh, when you, uh, oh, yeah. sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Well, it's just uh, when you, whenever you talk about different layers or different, different uh, uh, stacks, uh, I don't know, we were just talking about the Docker container stuff and, and hypervisor. You can't, Docker doesn't know, or the container that you're operating in doesn't know exactly where any of this other information is because it's unknown. It just, it operates the way it's supposed to, the way it's designed to. If I need to go outside of that environment to grab something else, I have to provide a, a path or an executable or, or a link to where that information is mm -hmm. to successfully execute that, that uh, command or that function. We're talking about variables, but it all kind of means the same thing. No, yeah, I know. And I, and when you're, when you're talking there, like I was thinking about, cause I went, cause Hadley has this video that he put out in like 2018. That's like five minutes to explain tidy evaluation. And he explains it like a tree. Eh, I'm not going to draw it. It's not worth it. But like he, um, he explains, I, I didn't know what he was saying. He's he, at first he's like, it's like a tree, you, you know, you have like a tree and it goes down certain levels. And when you said the levels, now it, now that finally clicked for me because I didn't understand what he meant by tree, but it's actually different levels and how you reach for, for different things in those different levels, you have to use different syntax to do that. That actually clicks for me now because when he was talking about that, I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about, but it's like, it's the environments, you know, and you have that tree which shows how environments are related to each other. So I, it, now I understand that part of the video a lot better, but um, cause now I understand what he was saying by, by it. It's like, you could express any function by a tree. And I was just like, I have no idea, but that clicks now that makes sense. But now what we're going to do is we're going to apply this in a shiny context. And so what we're going to do is we're going to first kind of talk about data masking functions. And so data masking functions allow us to use variables in the current data frame without any, any extra syntax. And so some of the functions that employ data masking are range, filter, group by muta mutate, summarize, and ggplot aesthetic. The other types of functions uh, that it talks about are tidy selection functions. These provide concise ways of selecting variables by position, name, or type. And so some of these functions that employee tidy selection are select, across, pivot longer, pivot wider, separate, extract, and unite. We're not gonna talk about all of these tonight, but some of these will kind of show up in some of the examples. Um, so let's kind, of, let's kind of talk about how we would get this to work, our example using tidy evaluation. And so uh, with this problem, it's basically a data masking problem. Uh, so data masking can be solved by using two different objects within, you know, tidyverse functions. We have the dot data, which explicit, which explicitly calling a data variable, or environment, which would be explicitly calling an environment variable. And so in our case right here, if we want this to filter correctly, if we want to filter this correctly using these environment variables, we have to explicitly state the data that we want to use, what variable we want to pull it from, and then this environment variable, which is min. So if we want to get this to actually work within the context of Shiny, we have to be explicit to which location or environment to which we are trying to pull it from. So does that, does that make sense? That, I mean, because now that I'm thinking about it, now, now I just have that tree idea in my mind. Like, what, how does this tree look? You know, does it start with like the system environment, go on to the other environment, and then how these things are all related? But in the case with tidy evaluation, especially when we have data masking issues, or we're, we're taking on a problem with data masking? No. We are taking on a data masking problem we're going to explicitly use dot data and dot environment to reference those specific variables that we want to use. Does that top one work run correctly or is that? That's a good question. Now that I'm looking at it, I'm going to okay. double check. Tidy evaluation. So let's look. 
Um, okay, so here's the example right here. So here's min var, we run this one. This one does work, but when we use this one, this one will not because we're, we're saying var here, right? But it thinks that we're pulling on this environment var, this environment, this environment, environment variable, excuse me. And so for us to be able to use this environment variable, no, to use the, the, the data variable, we have to use the dot data, right? Am I saying that correct? I'm gonna make sure I'm doing this right. Yep, right here, right? Because here's the same example. Doesn't, this one does work. This one does work. This one does work because we do the dot data var because we're, spit, we're explicitly saying, pull this from the data object and then use that specific string value of var MPG. Is that clear? I'm trying not to muddy this up. Yeah, that makes more sense to me now because I was, I had it reversed like that second or that first one with the, yeah, where you're at. I had that in my mind with that was the same example that you had above. So that makes more sense to me now. I think I need to change this around to be var here, right? Because this, we don't want this to, we want this to run incorrectly. Like yeah, this doesn't run correctly, right? doesn't okay doesn't filter correctly like we wanted to and that's because it's thinking that we're passing the string value into it which it's thinking what we're doing and i'm just doing this to make this clear it's thinking that we're doing mpg is greater than min and that's not true because we don't we don't have this you know we're not referencing it correctly. Is everybody following? Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks for correcting me on that. Um, okay, so do, 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 so that's data masking. Um, then the book starts going through some examples of how to apply this in Shiny. And so I'm just gonna kind of kick off these applications and we can kind of look at how they apply this, this data masking within the code. Um, so this first example, I'm just going to remind myself what it does. Run it. You know, I really appreciate or like the way you are writing the uh, uh, script to run the, the code immediately. Um, in the past, I've fumbled through clicking around trying to find the, the, uh, the uh, server to, to or run the example. Um, with that shortcut, that's easier to, to apply. Yeah, I started thinking about that. And I was also thinking about this too, because then we can kick it off into showcase mode and we can kind of see it together. Like I kind of miss my, I kind of miss having a bigger screen because then I could have like our studio up here along with this, but this is the next best thing. Um, but anyway, here's our application, right? We give our user the ability to select their specific variable that they want to filter based off of. So, and then we let them set a threshold. And so, we're obviously looking at the diamonds data set and we're setting a, a floor of three on carrot. And so we're only returning data that has, are only returning diamonds that are greater than a, uh, greater than a carrot of three. But looking at the code, I mean, the UI is the same, that's all the same. But the thing that we're doing now to make our filtering actually work in comparison to our first example is now we're explicitly using this dot data in our filter statement so that we can take this input var so it knows that we want to pull it from the specific data object itself and not the environment variable. We're actually pulling it from this data within the data set. Now here it's applying that dot environment to know explicitly that we're pulling this min input from the environment. And then, you know, obviously here's our output, which is our table. But again, to get this filtering to work, we have to be explicit by using this dot data and this dot environment for this to actually work within the context of Shiny. <clears throat> okay, so that's that one. Here's this one here. Uh, these next few examples, I mean, they just use the same kind of concept. You know, it's referencing two data variables 
This one I think is allowing us to look uh, to create a scatter plot based on inputs from the user. So we're going to run this one. Yep. So here's the scatter plot. We're looking at 12, 2. No, 12, 3. Okay. Um, so I'm not going to dig too much in the UI, but basically it just creates those two input or those three inputs where the user gets to select which variables they want on the X and Y of this, of this uh, plot. And then it allows them to select the specific geome to which um, they want the data or what shape they want their data to take. But what's important about this one is that it's applying this, uh, it's applying this data masking solution in ggplot. And again, we have to use this dot data in our aesthetic for it to actually work. And so we're using our dot data input dollar sign X. Same thing with this dot data here, input Y. Again, because we want to explicitly reference um, the specific data object within our data set that is getting passed into ggplot, which comes from the data set iris. So nothing too complicated. It's pretty much the same example, just applying it within ggplot. And then this next one is pretty similar to that other one, but just for the sake of being comprehensive, let's run it and look at it. Mm -hmm. So here what we're doing is we're allowing the user to select their specific variable that they want to, and I think it's filtered. We have the range. Yep, this is just another filtering example where we're allowing the user to select the specific variable that they want to filter by, set the minimum value, and then it also allows you uh, some sorting capability, which, which um, column you want to sort by. But looking at tidy evaluation, what we want to point out here is, is that because we're using, um, because we're using, uh, because we're using a data masking here, we need to make sure we use the dot data in this case right here as well, because we want to explicitly say, hey, take this specific variable from this, from the data set that's being, um, carried through into that filter statement. Okay. There really wasn't much difference between those, those three examples. Um, unless I'm missing something, did anybody else have anything else? Something that just came to mind. So your drop down menu of the, the selection, uh, let's just use the top one cylinder. That is only what is contained in the header or the, the, the name of the, the variable, correct? I, my, my, my mind is spinning here because I, I, I might be able to use this as an example to simplify something I'm doing currently, um, but also have it within a shiny interactive setting. Um, currently, I'm, I'm, I'm writing ggplot outputs of xy coordinate plotting for like, I don't know, 30 variables. And so it, the, the document gets really, really big and it's really heavy. If I were to do it in an interactive mode, like we're showing here, I would be able to select what I'm asking between X and Y. That pedals one that you had uh, in example, uh, was it 12-2? Um, that it actually triggered me to, to maybe rewrite what I'm doing right now. Yeah. It's 12-3. Or 12-3, okay. That's, that's really awesome to, to be able to select within your current data set. Currently, I've got 110 variables what is it that you want to plot on your X and Y comparison? So instead of, you know, writing the code, copying and pasting a hundred times over, you could just use a shiny app, make those selections and get your plot all within an interactive mode. Um, my mind is blown, Colin. I think you, you have, uh, or if you script that, write that, a, write a function for that. <laughs> good point. Yes. Right. Right. Maybe oh, that's yeah. what I, go back to uh, uh, the very beginning chapters and, and follow that uh, instruction instead. Well, I mean, you almost could modularize this, right? Like if you knew you were going to have a bunch of scatter plots that you wanted to which you're going to have different inputs to, you could modularize it and then just use this data masking or, you know, use this data masking to, you know, have that one function. But again, the power of this really come, you know, I can't claim to solve this. This is not mine. This is, this is somebody way smarter than me figured this out. Well, I do want to say that like, this was something that 
maybe I'm way off base and someone correct me, but like, this hasn't been something that I've known probably, probably the past year or two years ago, because I don't know if anybody ever remembers using like the bang, bang or the quo sure on quo Kevin's Kevin shaking his head. I I remember trying to comprehend that. And right when I needed them to change it, they did. I should have played the lottery too, because that was perfect. Because I really needed them to change that because I couldn't figure it out. Like that is the one thing that makes this so confusing is because those materials are still available and they and and they still work. Like if you want to use them, but like you used to have like if you wanted to do this in a function, and I'm not I'm talking this outside the context of shiny, but you used to have to use this like unquo quo. Then you had to use like the the bang bang, which was the double exclamation point. Um, other times you needed to do like you needed to use the walrus. Like if you were having like if you had like a, a mutate function in here and you're going to change the name for that, you had to have like it just it didn't make any sense. Like it was just one of those things where it was just like I'm just throwing the syntax in here. If it works, it works. I'm going to test it a couple times, and it just didn't make any sense. But I, 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 someone correct me if I'm wrong. And if somebody's watching this later on YouTube, please tweet at me or whatever, if I'm way off base, but like, I don't really remember this being a thing until about like maybe a year, two years ago, but uh, this has clarified this so much more than what it used to be. Because before it was like, if you wanted to use like ggplot or dplyr in like a function, it was, it would just, it just didn't make any sense of what you applied where. So if anybody's watching this and you come across those quotient stuff, learn this instead because this is so much easier. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, I'd say this is clarifying for me because I haven't used that in that context. I've been using the double brackets um, or the, I, I mean, uh, the squirrely brackets. I use that method all the time, but I was a, a bit shaky on this and this is clarifying it well for me. Yeah. And yeah. Now the another thing is now the, the double curly brackets, which I've used a lot more now, it's just has clarified it a lot more, which is, which is great. Um, but you know, those are other topics that go beyond, you know, just in a shiny application. Those are like, if you're doing using, you know, dplyr or using tidyverse stuff in a package or in other functions as well. But like I said, this stuff transcends other contexts. So it's good to learn it. Uh, so let's see. Um, okay. So the input variable. Oh, so I thought this was kind of interesting. Uh, just kind of an interesting like edge case. Like the question basically was like, yeah, you could do these things, but what if you want to give your user the functionality to input their own data? And that data had this, had a column name or a variable named input. And I was like, oh, that's, that's kind of an interesting thing. And so it kind of walks through like how you could address that. And so basically it kind of shows you like this right here. Um, and it, it says it can, you, you can basically use tidy evaluation principles to handle this, right? Because you can explicitly say, hey, I want to pull this from my data. So this example right here, you can see that it creates a list of variable with a string of X and a minimum of zero. And then it uses, creates this data frame that has three variables, an X, a Y, and then this input variable, which is a three. and so what it's if you try to do this at first and you try to uh you try to do this it's going to give you an error because you're not explicitly telling it that you want the input variable from the data set and so to fix that you have to use the dot data and explicitly say i want the input var and then use the dot environment input min and then it will filter correctly so i thought that was like a really interesting edge case because you know if you want to give your user that functionality what does happen if they do have like a variable that has, you know, the same name as something within your, within your code? Well, in this case, you can just use these like tidy evaluation principles to fix that and address that. But uh, then the book kind of has a conversation about, you know, why not use base R? And again, I, I'm a tidyverse person, so I don't know much about base R. I probably should learn more about it. So if I'm way off base, someone please correct me. If somebody's watching this later, I, I don't, I don't prescribe to any camp. Uh, I just, I, I just use tidyverse. So, but the book kind of talks about that in simple cases, 
you might find using base R a better fit. And so like, if you're doing like simple filtering and stuff like that, you may not necessarily need to use tidyverse. And the book also is pretty explicit that it doesn't discourage the use of base R. However, it really tries to discuss some of the benefits of using tidyverse and tidy evaluation in this. One being that tidyverse functions work more consistently across multiple cases. And so it has flexibility built into it to handle certain edge cases that base R function or base R approaches to these problems necessarily don't. Um, we can talk more about those, but I'm not going to dig into it. But um, and I, I'll be honest, I don't know enough about the differences between the two to really say like which is better where outside of what the book has described. So, but does anybody want to add to that? Is anybody like a base R person here? The, the one comment I'll add about base R versus tidy, if, if, if you're in that camp, that school of thought, is when you are attempting to read somebody else's code base and try to figure out what they're doing, um, if their base R and you're more familiar with that and you feel com comfortable and confident, go ahead and use it. If it is written in a tidy format with the pipes, and that is more of your school of thought. What is very, very, very problematic is when you mix both of them together. Uh, and that, that calls out, uh, I think that was one of the first engineering shiny apps topic was whatever it is you choose, just stick with it. Uh, don't try to mix and match between the two services because all you're going to do is, you know, the next developer that's following you up and, and, and you know, modifying, editing, maintaining your code base, they're not going to have any idea what you were doing, uh, at least choose a sanity, or sorry, choose an insanity so that at least everything else looks sane. Um, it's funny you mentioned that because I, I, I'm I guilty of intermingling, but not yes. in this, but it's in context though. I would say it's in context. Um, when I pull, when I do info boxes, I use base R to subset the part because it's just easier to do the double brackets rather than putting in a- Good point. Um, a subset just because it's just easier but it's in context it's not going from base r to yeah uh, yeah tidy. i can imagine it does to... have context but i do uh, yeah I, I intermingle a little bit <laughs> no, well i think I, i'll go ahead right no, no go ahead. i was just going to say if, if if it is that you're copying somebody else's code to try something or use use their their uh, logic in your in your app uh if you are not aware of what that particular call is doing. That's where I was talking about the comfortable. If, if you know what the code is doing, use it or figure out a way to transpose it into a more tidy form so that at least your entire structure is all using tidy uh, uh, syntax and not flip-flopping back and forth. I, I, I don't know, it's, it's another flame war that, that happens back and forth in the, in the Python community is, which Python should you use? Is it a you know a 2.0 family or is it a 3.0 family? I mean, just that argument alone will create an entire you know hour-long dissertation on which is better and which is worse. But either way, isn't there something about f strings or something in Python too? I don't. Know. Uh, 3.0 there is, uh, or at least in the newer versions of three, uh, they are starting to create a lot more eloquent ways of managing information. Um, I, I shared a, a comment with a colleague uh, just the other day in relation, he asked, you know, which version of language should I study more heavily? And I said, well, I mean, Python's going to be more uh, general purpose. So you're going to have a lot more options to do other things with it beyond just data, data analytics or data science. I said, but if you want to stick to the academia, you know, or the actual stats, the foundation of, of what you're doing, this entire program is built around that function alone it just happens to do other features as well. Does that make sense? Like in one, one sense, Python was written to rule the world and you just happen to use it for data science. And in R, it was built for statistical modeling. And then it just so happens to have shiny web applications, uh, R markdown for documentation, presentation, et cetera. So do one but, thing and do it really well. Well, that's, that's what I think with like, like tidyverse, you know, you know, some of the tidyverse packages, they were really focused on doing something really well, which was, you know, interactive data analysis, 
but then people wanted more functionality because they, you know, it, it did, it was really powerful. People wanted to extend it and use it in their, in their function logic and in their package logic. And so, but then with that, we have to provide more tools to allow us to do that. And so that's kind of where this kind of comes in as well is, is like, we have to, they have to build in that functionality and, and I'm going to say intuitive ways for people to use it so that we can apply it in, in the context that we want to apply it. So, um, cool. So the next thing is uh, tidy selection uh, and really talks about this, about indirection. And so with tidy selection, we need to use two functions to re refer to variables indirectly. And these two functions, basically what they do is they just take a character vector of um, inputs and you can kind of think of it as like a character vector of um, a character vector of variables within your data set. And so basically what happens is, is with any of, it will silently ignore if a variable is missing. All of, it's going to throw an error if a variable is missing. And so the book really talks about in the context of Shiny, it's really good to kind of see the use of any of and all of when we're doing kind of the group by summarize um, kind of step or data manipulation or data um, aggregation. And so what we're going to do is we're going to quick look at this application here, um, kind of has a group by summarize in it. Copy it here. Control V. We'll go 12.4. Um, and so when we look at this application right here, what it has is, oh, we're looking at the wrong one, 12.3.1. Okay. Um, so you can see here, here's our UI. We're giving the, uh, the user the ability to select what variable they want to group by. And in this case, I'm just going to do cylinder because I know this is a factor. And then it's going to allow us to summarize whatever we want. And so I'm just going to do miles per gallon in this case. It automatically, oh, can I do miles per gallon? What about displacements? There's displacement. Let's do displacement. Um, and so how this actually works right here is, is that we're actually passing a character vector of variables into these inputs. And so I could change this into weight. I can change this character vector to, let's do quarter seconds. And so now we have this character vector. And if we want to actually use this to summarize and add to it, what we're going to use is the across. We're going to use it and summarize. We're going to use across, which basically is across all these variables. And what we want to do is we want to use all of the variables in this input vector, which is our input of our S, which is our summarize. We're going to apply this mean function to it. So we're just going to calculate a mean based on the group by that we've set up of the top in our case being cylinder. And so this only, this tidy selection only works as long as we're using all of or any of. And in our case, we're using all of because all of will throw an error if a variable is missing. If we just want to, you know, be silent if a variable is missing, we would use any of. But if we want to make sure that there is a warning, say our user provides an input that we don't want, we use all of. So this pretty much just takes care of anything with any of the, the tidy selection issues. Just use all of or any of. So what questions does anybody have about tidy selection? I think this one was pretty straightforward. I mean, I don't think there was anything too complex about it. Um, Hmm. Okay. The next thing was parse eval. Uh, I read this and I said, I've never used this. So I don't have any examples and the book didn't have any examples. So I was going to open it up to anybody here. Does anybody have any experience of, of what was going on here? Or, um, cause I had, I, I had no previous experience of doing this in any of my work. So I can take a stab at being naive about it. Um, the parse variable is searching in your data set for a object, right? Or something that matches your, your uh, info. And then eval would be some kind of criteria, maybe evaluate that, that selection that you just made. I don't know. I'm probably not giving it the right context. I'm only seeing what parse plus eval would, would uh, imply. No idea. Uh, Kevin, do you have any experience with this? No. 
<laughs> so sorry to anybody that's out there after this meeting I, I i i don't have any experience and i kind of read it and i was like where would you where would this be applied and why would this be an issue and i just i, I just don't have the experience to back it up so um but there was no uh, and then the book didn't really have any examples of where the where it was applied it basically said two things it was said just don't, you know, try to avoid this. I mean, if it solves the solution, use it, but also know that it creates some type of security vulnerability, which we'll talk about later in like chapter 22. And so um, it really didn't provide any examples or go any further than that. So, well, that's tiny evaluation. Um, like I said, I didn't, I had, I didn't have the ability to really dive deep into it to like really understand it outside of the context of shiny but I really think it kind of comes down to just this idea of environment variables and data variables and how are you trying to solve this problem? Do you have a data masking problem or do you have a tidy selection problem that you're going to use? And so, you know, it really comes down to those two things, especially within the context of Shiny. I think this kind of really clarifies how these are applied. So does anybody else have anything that they want to add? Any other questions? Did I miss anything? Was I way off base? Um, I'll just open it up for anybody else. Super handy. I usually don't let my users do it. I have it. I before it gets to shiny, I've already done the data manipulation that I want them to see. But this gives me some maybe some options. Well, that's what. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Kevin. I was gonna say if. If I ever come to the point where you run into a client that wants to manipulate it themselves a little bit more and I have the trust that they could do it correctly, you know, and interpret it. But so, so this is super helpful. I like the options that were, were given as uh, examples. I keep coming back and I, I, I think I've shared it maybe at an early chapter, maybe early session. But there was, uh, uh, has anybody done any work with the World Data Bank uh, or, or it's the World Bank data? I think it's labeled as World Data Bank. Either way, it's, it's, a, it's a particular um, site where you can kind of wiki whiz GUI query the data set and it will produce some level of output. My critique for the, the app or the service though is it is very, very, very slow. And I don't think it's from an internet speed standpoint it's probably just the hosting of that, of that logic. When we're in these later chapters of Shiny and, and, and exercising some of the options that we can provide as a developer and genera uh, generating a, uh, a user interface or a user uh, uh, experience, knowing, understanding, and how to apply these is great if you are to compare it to something that is currently existing. Um, I'll find the link for everybody if you want to go check out what I'm after, but it's it's World Bank data, and so like if you want to use anywhere in the uh, anywhere in the uh, world, any country code, um, you can look at demographics, societal type data, uh, uh, monetary economy type data. Um, it screams to me shiny, but I know it's not built on shiny. I don't know what engine they're using to to generate their their. Uh, experience. I'm just saying it's a little bit slow. Uh, don't, don't expect a uh, supercomputer export when you're, when you're creating some mass query and hoping to plot something that may not actually work for you. Um, while you were talking about that a little bit, I, was, I got reminded of another resource that I came across when I was digging for this stuff. It was kind of funny how, like when I was looking at this, and it might just be the algorithm for Twitter, but as I was kind of researching this throughout the week, I kept getting like tweets about this, um, people asking questions about it. And I came across this really interesting one and I might share this out to the group in the Slack, but somebody put together this, this kind of like aggregate of like tidy evaluation resources. And I think this goes way beyond Shiny. So, I mean, this is gonna talk about tidy evaluation. Um, in different contexts. And so what they did is they created a aggregate of different talks 
and different things about tidy evaluation that you can access and read more about. And so I think this topic, you know, goes way beyond than just using dot data, dot environment, and any of all of. So uh, I do highly, I'll put this in the Slack for people to look at it and you can kind of dig over it. I haven't dug through all of it, but it looks pretty good and it has a lot of information that you could probably pull from to learn more about it. So cool. Anything else? I found the web URL that I was after. Uh, I don't know if you want to open it, Colin, or not. Um, I just used a given indice or a given mm -hmm. data set or a database. Uh, this one happened to be the global economy prospects. So what you're seeing on the left is all of the various selections that you can make. So you can select your country, select your range, select your this, that, whatever. And then it will output some uh, graphical representation of, of what it's uh, uh Putting together, it's just very slow. That's the one thing that I will I will uh, critique. But I'm not making that in a negative context. What I would rather do is use there's a there's a world. It's the world uh, World Bank Open Data. That's the term I'm saying. Hmm. The uh, there's a an R package that calls on the APIs of this particular service, and it is a lot snappier. Uh, you can you can render things a lot faster that way. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, they're uh, thinking about that too, you know, like having your data in a format for your user to easily access it and process it. I, you know, going back to, I think, like, or maybe like our second or third week that we were talking about it, like, you know, trying to do that kind of front end or that back end stuff so that you don't have to have your application doing a lot of this. Yeah. It's nice to provide this flexibility. Like Kevin said, but at to what, you know, for I what Kevin, benefit? I always love Kevin's comment of, of managing data before the user gets access to it. Um, you've already done all the, the lake work for them, uh, providing them tidy information, tidy uh, data they can they can generate reports from. Yeah, it's all about audience, you know, you there have you to go. know your audience. Some it's going to be appropriate for where they can do the manipulation. Some it's not. <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I, I don't know, you know, you know, some people, I don't know if I would give this to, because it would be, I mean, but I think it goes back to that thing where it's like, you're, it goes back to that thing of like, with this topic here, it's like, you're creating an interface for people who don't know how to use our code to use our code, specifically Tiverse code. And I thought that was pretty powerful. Like, you know, it's a lot easier to, to say to somebody, hey, just put some inputs into this rather than, all right, we're going to talk about uh, group by summarize using a dplyr deep deep pipeline. You know, that's a lot harder when I, when I can, you know, put something together like this real quickly and say, you know, just plug in a couple inputs, play around with it, you know, see what happens. Obviously, I got an error because I can't have this two things, but you can do validation checking or something with that. So, but yeah, you know, it just creates that interface to get people to use tidyverse code essentially but those are my half-baked thoughts anyways anything else i mean i can hang out for a little while longer if you guys want to hang out i don't i we're already we're already six minutes over so i don't want to force anybody to say um but just quick reminder next week we won't be meeting because we'll be taking a break so I don't know if you'll see a Zoom meeting, but I'll make sure I, I catch that real quick and be like, hey, no meeting tonight, but just so everybody knows we're not going to meet next week. And then we'll pick up in two weeks from now. So awesome. Awesome.